Can we? There we go. All right. My goodness, look at these beautiful faces. I'm so excited y'all are here. My name is Mia Birdsong. I am a New America Fellow. And this woman to my right, your left, is of course Brittany Cooper. In case you don't know, Brittany is a professor of Africana and Gender Studies at Rutgers University, co-founder of the Crunk Collective, and she wrote this book, <laughs> which you can purchase out there and later get signed. Um, so we are going to have a conversation today with Brittany, and then I'm bringing some of my favorite, other favorite people up on stage to continue the conversation. And we're just going to talk about how badass black women are. Yeah. That's what we're doing here, y'all. <laughs> so. Brittany, yes. you, this book just came out. Oh my How long did you spend writing this book? Six years. Six years, y'all. Yeah. Oh, Lord, okay. Listen. I don't think I've done anything for six years. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us, we're just getting right into it. I'm not going to talk a bunch. Um, tell us what inspired you to write this. Um, yeah, so thank you, Mia. Um, I'm really grateful to you for organizing this event. Thank you to my family who is in the audience. So I have two college classmates who are in the audience, Arabella Little Page and Lakeisha McClary. Um, and they wave know your hands. I want to see who you are. Yay, there we H go. Yay, excellence. That's right, we went to Howard together. Um, the, yes. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so part of the reason I want to acknowledge them is because they're, oh, and then, and then Nicole Mason, who's also my colleague, and a Howard alum. Um, part of the reason I wanted to acknowledge them is because Howard is really a part of this story. So I love Howard. I will put you out of my house if you talk to me about Howard in any but the most illustrious way, if you're not a Howard alum. If you're a Howard alum, you can talk all kind of shit. It's like family. So That's right. Yes. So when I was at Howard, we learned about the history of all of these illustrious black leaders um, because the campus is sort of teeming with that history. Um, but I didn't learn about all of these amazing black women. So when I was at Howard, Anna Julia Cooper was a name on a street sign over off T Street. Um, Pauli Murray was not somebody whose name I knew at all. Mary Church Terrell, who lived also down on T Street, was not a person that I knew. So I left Howard, I went into a PhD program, and I was taking my first course in black feminist thought. And I began to read Beverly Gosheft Hall's book, Words of Fire, as part of that course. And so it began to name all of these amazing black women and their thought. And as I learned more about the bios of these women, I realized that they all had connections to Howard. They were Howard alum, or they lived around the corner. And I wondered how I had gone to this amazing place and had never heard of them. And so it set me on fire, to, one, as part of my own coming into feminist consciousness, that if I wanted black people to get free, but I didn't even know what black women had had to say about that, then my liberation project was going to be incomplete. And two, that black women have been badasses from the beginning. And I wanted to know what the, what the long intellectual legacy of that looked like. And I also had this distinct sense, particularly being an academe, that people were very enamored with white boys and the way that they do theory. Um, and I say white boys because I'm from the South, and also y'all know why I'm calling mm -hmm. them white boys, right? And, um, and so I was like, black women are not new to this. They're true to this. They've been doing this. They have a lot to say about the American project and all of its problems and possibilities. And I want people to take black women seriously as theorists. And I felt like when I looked at the history, people were talking about how they were amazing, how they were activists and organizers and church leaders and mothers. And yet, they had these whole bodies of thought and nobody was taking any of that work seriously in a sustained way. And I wanted to be able to, one, understand that and then make the case that we should. Mm. So what are some of those thoughts that black women develop that we need to know about? Sure. So this book spans about almost, it spans 75 years. So I start in 1892, I go to the mid-1970s. Um, the introduction to the book begins with Anna Julia Cooper, because it's cool as shit to me that I get to know who the very first black woman Dr. Cooper was. <laughs> right? That's really cool. Um, and so, but also when I read her book, A Voice from the South, and she was grappling with what it meant to be a Christian, what it meant to be a black woman from the South, what it meant to be a feminist and to not be particularly enamored with black men, you know, I fell in love with her and have come back to that book over and over again in my journey. So I begin with her, and I use her as the theorist that frames this book. Um, and I say that the way that, and so I say that I'm an, uh, a Cooperian scholar, that I'm an Anna Julia Cooper, I take an Anna Julia Cooper approach to understanding black women's lives. 
Um, and then, so I excavate a few black women. Fanny Barrier Williams was this dope black woman from Chicago, part of the, uh, I think her people from DC, but she moves to Chicago, she's part of the elite. And she's really a top-notch theorist, but she can't go to school, uh, you know, because black women in the late 1890s don't have that much access to a college education and to PhDs. But one of the things that she says, and these are her words, she says, we need a new sociality, right? We need a new theory of social relationships among black people. So she came from the upper class, but she recognized that there needed to be a way for black people to understand each other across class divides. And so she said, look, we need a new racial sociality, a way of relating to each other that is about getting free, that is not tied to our varied class position. Now, we can talk about whether you agree, but the point is that she's advancing a theory in 1897 where she's using the kind of academic language that now gets taken up uh, in feminist thought as affect theory that talks all the time about sociality, right? And yet she's sort of saying class divides keep black people apart. And so what is the basis by which black people can create solidarity if it's not based on like essentialist ideas about blackness, right? So that's one. Um, and she says many other things. Two, I talk about Mary Church Carroll. Mary Church Carroll came from a rich family in Memphis. She lived down on T Street. She was probably the most famous black woman of her day, the most well-known public intellectual. She lived to be not, um, 95, 90. She lived to be 90. She was born in 1863. She brought the case that desegregated the District of Columbia in 1953. Mm. That's one year before Brown. Mm. But she had literally 60 years of activism in the ensuing period. So many firsts, too many to name. And so she said she believed in dignified agitation. Now, she was the queen of respectability, and she was kind of shady to poor black women in the ways that we might imagine these rich black girls to be. Um, but she said, look, like we should take it to white people. We should be in their faces. We should agitate, agitate, agitate. There's no pretty way to do it. But she said, look, but there's, we can be dignified about it, right? We don't have to tear things down, but we should be, in, we should be on them about our rights at all times. And so I argue that that theory, which she starts in around 1905, and which she's still talking about in 1951 at the height of the desegregation cases in DC, links together the sort of respectability era that we're so sort of, you know, we're skeptical about now, and nonviolent direct action. So she has a theory that brings those two things together. She says, look, I believe in agitation. I just believe there's a dignified way to do it, right? Um, and then I talk about Pauli Murray. People are talking about Pauli Murray more now. She literally has too many firsts to name. But when I started this dissertation, people were, as a, this book is a dissertation, people weren't talking about Pauli Murray. She graduated top of her class at Howard Law in 1944, um, but she was the first to do many things. One of the things maybe most relevant um, in terms of her actual body of work is she, as a senior at Howard Law School, her last year, her, her thesis for Howard Law, she created the theory for Brown versus Board. She wrote it as a paper. And then 10 years later, the law professors who, were, who, who tried Brown were her professors. So they said, you know, we had a student 10 years ago who came up with this innovative theory that maybe what we should do is just challenge Plessy v. Ferguson as a whole. Because at that point, they were just saying, we want separate but equal, and we need y'all to make things equal. And she said, well, Plessy v. Ferguson itself is a problem, right? And so they took her theory, they tried the case they wanted, and then they didn't tell her that till 10 years after the fact. But the other thing that's really interesting about Polly Murray is that she was a queer, an out queer black woman from the 1930s forward, masculine performing, and today she would have identified as trans. So Polly Murray was going around in the 1930s saying, give me hormones, I need hormone therapy because I'm a man, please do exploratory surgery, I need you to find the sort of you know, biological basis for this, the sort of physiological basis for this, but she's literally two decades before her time. So the word transgender doesn't even get invented until the 1950s. And so people certainly aren't thinking about gender affirmation surgeries in the 1930s. And so she keeps saying to people, I'm not, I'm not a lesbian. I'm a man, right? These are the same battles over identity that we're having today. And so this woman is, do so I call her a woman because <coughs> by the end of her life, given where medical science was, she just says, cool, I'm a woman, I'm queer. Unfortunately, I'm in a time where how I understand my identity doesn't, is not understood. And so I'm going to make the best that I can, make the best of this that I can. So she has an open lesbian partnership. It makes everybody <coughs> mad. 
because she's this <laughs> huge sort of civil rights attorney, and she becomes the first black woman Episcopal priest. I mean, there are literally so many firsts that I, I could just shock you. I mean, every decade, the chick was just bad. She was just bad, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, so I talk about, all, so she's at the core of lots of things. She's really at the core of creating sort of one of the frameworks for intersectionality within the law that Kimberly Crenshaw fills in. She writes an, so she has a JD, a couple of master, a master of laws, a, an MDiv, and every one of those projects is groundbreaking. The MDiv thesis, she says, well, let me compare feminist theology to black theology. But she's doing that in 1976, before the term womanist even exists. Wow. So yes. And then last, I end uh, in the civil rights era. And I talk about Tony Cade Bambara. Um, and essentially, I mean, I talk about many women in the civil rights era. But essentially, one of the things I say about her is that her concept of blackhood is a concept that we should revisit. Um, because she says that sort of binary gender roles really are a problem and that what we should think of, it's interesting because it's sort of an idea of racial sociology, soci sociality, that we should think about blackhood as a way for black people to come together that is not rooted in gender norms but is rooted in a sort of commitment to blackness. But it's a very progressive notion of blackness, right? One that is fundamentally queer because it is fundamentally anti-normative. Um, but is about, so she's about sort of a black feminist revolution, but she's trying to think about what is the basis by which black people can form a new set of social relationships to each other not rooted in respectability, right? Um, and so that's why this book is called Beyond Respectability, because in all of these ways, these women never sit, they never stay in the space that respectability offers. So Williams is challenging the class dynamics of respectability by saying, look, like, I have a social class, but I, my cause is fundamentally with black people, right? Um, you know, Terrell says, look, I think we ought to agitate, which is not the respectable position. I just want to be dignified, so she's kind of in the middle. Pauli Murray wants to be respectable, but is queer and trans, and so can't do it fully, <laughs> ever to anybody's kind of yep. liking. Uh, and then Tony K. Mombar just says, F respectability, right? And let's get some blackhood together. So one of the things you talk about in the book is how you can't, how important it is to, un, if you understand these women's ideas, that you also have to understand their lives and the context and, and the, their personal stories. Yeah. Um, so, and you're like in the archives, looking through people's like yeah. memoirs and writings and diaries and stuff. Yeah. So can you tell us, I want to hear stories that don't show up, you know, kind of in the, in the public narrative we have of some of these women. Um, that humanize them. Yeah, so that was really important to me to be able to talk about that they weren't and just talk about why it's important too. Like why sure. it's not just important. We we typically think you know when we see black women in public, there's a way in which they cease to be human. They're either you know we talk about this right. Black women are hyper visible and invisible at the same time. So all of their flaws, all of these stereotypes are on display, and that even happens to these very respectable, educated, polished black women that they too are wondering about the politics of public visibility. And so what are they risking by, you know, by showing up to do the work that they do and risking their lives and risking scrutiny in a moment where black women are actively being raped and terrorized by white men. But they have private lives too in all kinds of sort of battles with each other and interesting takes on relationships. And you know, I'm, so I was interested in all of that. And one of the things I tell people is that one of the reasons that I became a historian sort of in the process of doing this project is because archives are where you get all the tea and you can verify it, right? <laughs> it's like all the rumors, you read all the juicy letters, they're all in there and there's all these sort of battles and people are talking all manner of shit about each other, it's great. Um, and so like, you know, there, Ida B. Wells' diary has been published, so I don't tell the story in this book, but like, Ida B. Wells was a flirt, she had like all these male suitors, she was running dude, she had a reputation for being a flirt. Um, and she also had a, like a shopping habit. So Ida B. Wells loved pretty dresses. And so sometimes she couldn't make the rent because she spent too much money <laughs> as a dressmaker shop. She did. Now she was, you know, she was an anti-lynching activist. I mean, rah, rah, Ida, but she was like, and I'm going to look great while I do it. You know what I mean? Which is why, you know, we didn't just, this didn't just start. You know, this thing where we slay everywhere. Right? Or like, or like in Mary Church Terrell's archive, there's a picture of her. My mom owned a like dress shop at one point. Her mom could make really pretty dresses. 
but her mom was a hairdresser and she owned like a hair shop. And so there's a picture of it. It's from like 1877. And the sign on the front of it says, 100% real human hair sold here. And I was like, oh my God, black <laughs> women have been doing this forever. And Mary Church was talking about how they have, you know, how they have the best hair to, you know, add pieces for their, I forget all the names of them, but it's like one style where they have just extra hair right here, you know, like probably a very nice bob kind of situation, right? And they wanted, you know, human hair. And so, so those are the sorts of things. But then there, you know, there are these sort of other things right around. So like one of the stories that jumped out to me about Mary Church Terrell, because she's so respectable and so buttoned up, is that she talks in her autobiography about how when she was in college, she would sneak out of the dorms at night and go dance in the gym. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And she was like, oh, no, and I could dance as well as anybody. And, you know, I had a girl that I would meet, and we would dance. And I was like, so you would just sneak out of the dorm and go twerk in the middle of the night? Like, because that's essentially what she's doing. I mean, she's essentially going out and, like, we're practicing the latest moves or, you know, whatever the dance steps were, she's out doing it. And it was really interesting to be able to think about Mary Church Terrell as someone who insisted on having a bodily practice and a sort of joyful practice around dance. And I thought that was important and write about it in this book because she doesn't just talk about it at the beginning of the autobiography, but when she's in her 70s, when the autobiography ends, she's like, oh, no, I still dance every day. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm about that life, you know. This, um, and so, and then the other funny story. So I tell this story in the book. So Mary Church Royal was shady, and she goes to this conference in the early 1900s, and she's real light-skinned. And so sometimes when she would be traveling across the country on the train, she would pass for white. And we could have feelings about that, but she was like, well, these men late night on these trains in these rural southern towns might rape me, so I'm just going to be a white lady. So she goes to Germany. No, she's, no, she's in Austria. And she gets there, and um, all the women know that a black woman is coming from America to give a talk, but they don't know that she's the black woman. They think she's white. So they keep coming up to her going, Who's the ne where's the negress? Now think about that. And so, first, so she plays them, so she lets them do it for days. And she, and she can speak German, She too. can speak German, yes. she can speak French, she can speak Latin, she can speak Greek. Yes. She speaks all of it, she teaches it. So she lets them do this. And so then she's like, okay, I got it, I got it. So she was supposed to give the address in, like, French. Or, no, she's supposed to give it in English. So the night before, she was like, let me see how I can stunt. So she st she gets in her hotel room she translates her full address into german and french then on the day of she gets up gives the address in german turns around and gives it in french and that's when she tells them she's black and so she stands up and she's like you know behold you know my parents were in shackles and if it hadn't been for the war of 1865 i wouldn't be standing here before you today and then she says so behold a rare bird right just shady just like <laughs> Just, I'm not a common negress. Don't ever do that shit again, right? Just stunts <laughs> on these people. She just, it, it's the most amazing thing ever. And people think it's about respectability. And I'm like, these white girls have been coming up to her for days calling her a negress. And she's like, I got something for y'all. In multiple languages. I'm going to read you in every possible language that I have, right? And so I love her for that. And so a lot of people have written her off because she was, you know, she just had class stuff. She was bougie in a real way, and her people actually had money. And so she just didn't have the best class politics in particular moments. But there's a way in which she's really important, and where I see a lot of the sort of creativity and the, the black girl sort of verb that we have today, like what I loved about doing this book, was you could see that it was generationally created, right? That 100 years ago, black women would just be being shady. One last example. So. She and Ida B. Wells both hated that Frederick Douglass married a white girl. They hated it. And the way I know they hated it, they didn't say they hated it, they, but in both of their autobiographies, and the two of them didn't like each other. Mary Church Rowe and Ida B. Wells did not like each other because Ida thought Mary was bougie and terrible, and Mary thought Ida didn't have any class, and that she was sort of rough around the edges. And so they really didn't get, get down. But they didn't like that Frederick Douglass had married a white woman, so both of them get in their autobiographies and they go like, you know, look, he can marry whoever he wants. But Ida was like, I really wish he had married, you know, a beautiful, charming woman of our race, right? Uh, and then Mary Church Terrell was like, look, I mean, I wish he had married a black woman, but he has the right to marry whomever he wants. But let me just tell you that I've had three white men, uh, you know, propose to me and I turned all of them down. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, like, I was like, we've been doing this forever, forever, you know? Um, so, uh, particularly for these, the women you write about who are like, you know, they're public figures in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, um, at a time when the convention around gender was like, you know, you, you take the, the women's course if you go to college. Oh, you don't yeah. take the man's course because that takes too long and you'll be too old. That's right. And you can't know more than your husband, so That's you're right. not going to find a man. That's right. Um, so these women were negotiating around family and marriage in some really powerful ways yeah. at a time. Yeah. That it, I mean, you know, women's still doing that, but like for them, t talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So it's literally the same problem. So Mary Church Terrell is like, I'm at Oberlin. I want to take the gentleman's course because you take Latin and Greek. And folks were like, well, it'll unfit you for marriage. It will unsex you and no one will want you. And so she writes about how she basically feels like to get the education she wants, she's risking her entire romantic life. And she's, one of the, she's the first black woman I know to do that, to say I made an educational choice even though I thought it would put partnership in jeopardy. And it made me think about the ways that that's still such a question for black women today, whether educational options put partnership options in jeopardy. But literally, she's negotiating that in the 1880s, right? Um, and the thing that becomes interesting is that her husband is very progressive and is like down for woman suffrage very early. You know, and when they do get married, you know, he says to her, you know, she didn't, she didn't like speaking because she, um, she was like, I'm always traveling. Um, it took a toll on her body. Mary Church Row had lots of miscarriages, a couple of stillbirths, like a really hard time trying to have a baby. And so, you know, and struggled with depression greatly and all of that. You know, and her husband would just, one of the things he said to her was, you have the ability and you've had the training, so you owe it to our people to get out and do this work, which is a very progressive stance for a man to take in the 1890s, and Ida B. Wells' husband was very similar. Um, and, then you, and then you have Polly Murray, who's also negotiating that, too, later. Polly Murray's born in 1910. So she's negotiating this in the 1920s and 30s, and she's negotiating it in ways that are really interesting. So she's out to her family. They sort of always know that she's queer, which sort of gives lie to this notion that black communities are so homophobic. Mm -hmm. Right, there's a, a, a pretty interesting tradition of, so one of the things, one of the myths that I learned about Howard, or not myths, but like things about Howard was that, um, was that at Howard in the 1930s and 40s, there were lots of black lesbian girls that they were, you know, they, you know, basically the administration was like, you know, they had these little networks and they're all together and, you know, we have to watch them and stuff. Like it was all of this kind of thing. And so, Polly Murray is like dating girls, you know, falling in love. She would date black girls, and then they would, she would kick it to them real hard. They would fall for her, and then they had all this stuff about, but I'm really straight, though, and what does it mean that I love you and all of that? And then they would leave her, and then she, unfortunately, she would be like, I'm depressed, and then go, like, she would be admitted, because she wasn't, she really wanted to date a black woman. Part of it was that she was trans, and she was like, I'm a man, and these women keep on, you know, and, so she didn't deal well with being called a homosexual, right? So she was like, it's not that, right? She was like, it's my sex, it's not my gender mm -hmm. that's the problem. And then, you know, so then she fell for a white girl who she loved, and there are these great, if you go in the archives, there are these great pictures of Polly Murray in very masculine pose with her very white femme partner, but in the 1930s, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, that girl is like, I'm gonna get married too, because, you know, I guess it's just easier. <laughs> and so, so she's sort of negotiating that. And so one of the things that that, that that then causes for her is like, so there's a moment in the 1940s where, you know, bus desegregation actually happens much earlier than the 1950s, right? So in 1941, Polly Murray's on a bus to Petersburg, Virginia. She and they, they ask her and her partner to move back a seat. She won't because they're like, the seat is broken. And so they get arrested. But when they get arrested, she gives her name to the officer as Oliver because she's on the bus. It's not clear whether this girl is her girl or her home girl. Mm. But there, it becomes a whole thing because they get arrested. They ask the NAACP to take it as an early desegregation case. NAACP looks at it because they have been looking for opportunities to challenge desegregation statutes like they eventually do with, with Rosa Parks. And they couldn't do it, or they opted not to do it because it turned out that she was queer. And they didn't want the social sort of stigma around it. But, the, you know, but they were, 
but there was a guy who wrote a piece about it, a white guy who was on the bus, and he was like, oh no, this straight couple got hassled by the cops. <laughs> and so later the NAACP, he was like, oh, this is scandalous because people don't even know that you're a woman. I mean, it was a whole sort of thing, right? right. So she is really committed to her right to embody herself and her gender identity in whatever way she wants, even in the early 1940s. And yet, it, but think about what, how much farther in the civil rights struggle we would have been if homophobia and queer phobia, yeah. right, hadn't yes. prevented the NAACP from taking her yep. case, right? Um, but also the ways, and what I love about that story as well, is the ways in which it shows that even in a respectability discourse where black women are really hyper aware of what it means to be in public, that she was like, I'm gonna be in public with my partner. I'm gonna be in public with somebody that, you know, that matters to me in a loving way and I'm not going to be gender conforming while I do it. Um, and so there's something about that that really resists that respectability narrative in a moment of very heightened racial violence, right? That comes literally to her, her doorstep and, um, you know, but, but this is, these are just the sort of creative ways that black women continue to you know, continue to navigate and to say my personal life matters. Um, and, then, and then she, some years later, writes a piece called Why Negro Girls Stay Single. And she's like, oh, because all you dudes are out here tripping and y'all are trying to be, you know, she basically said, look, y'all are less educated than us, you feel some type of way about it and then you come home and treat us crazy because you feel some type of way about it. <laughs> And that's why, I mean, she says it, but like, go read it. And I was like, well, did you write this today, ma'am? Like, <laughs> so they've been like this. Oh, well, damn. Like, you know, so <laughs> the great thing is, you know, there's real historical context for it. The problem is you're like, but 70 years ago, it was, it was still bad. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you spent six years writing this book. Um, you are, what, okay. Um, you are, thank you. You know, you're in the archives, you're reading the theory, you're reading about these ideas, you're reading these stories. Yeah. Um, how did it change you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't fully know the answer. Um, I, feel, I feel vindicated in that when I started this, I remember when I was shopping the book proposal around and folks were like, well, that sounds like stuff that we've been saying. You know, people have been saying that black women are thinkers, and I was like, well, show me the receipts then. Like, can you tell me something that you know that a black woman said that you teach in a class that you teach? And nobody could tell me that, but they could talk to me about Du Bois and King and Booker T. Washington and all those people all day long, but they could never, they kept saying that they knew, but I was like, but act like you know, though, right? right? Um, and so, so this process helped me to, to know, Thank you. Mm -hmm. this process helped me to know that my instincts were right. Um, that there was a story here. Um, you know, and I, I think I, I feel in good company. You know, I feel like part of the work that I'm trying to do in the world is really to continue the legacy of these women. And I felt like when I was in the archives and when I was reading their stories, they showed up and met me and said, the struggle is real, girl. It's been real. Yes. Um, but we made it. And we made a lasting impact. And it's one that if you just look just a little bit, you can see it everywhere. Um, and I, you know, and I feel like I got to tell that story. I think the other thing to say is that I'm tired. Um, and it's really important to say that because sometimes we don't own that the work takes its toll. And so when I read about, I looked at Polly Murray's medical records and um, there was a little bit of challenge sometimes with, you know, when writing about her because her family members didn't always want that sort of stuff to be told. But Polly Murray left her archive. She specifically left it. She wrote about, I'm over here filing these things away from my archive, because even, and she would say things like, I know that people don't appreciate me now, but I'm gonna be real important one wow. day, right? And she's right. Um, and, you know, but she, but when I looked, but I was like, so I know that there's a reason that you left a, a neat file with all of your medical records collected. Because she wanted us to have a history of the cost and the toll that she paid for the legacy that she left. But also, I think, as, a, as an affirmation, though, that she made it, you know, that she struggled and that she, but also that she went into the hospital, but that she came out each time. And so there's, you know, so I appreciate that she challenged the stigma of, ha of mental illness and recognizing that so many sisters, Mary Church Terrell, same thing, struggled deeply with depression because how can you lose that many babies and not struggle, yeah. right? 
but she owned it, you know, and Mary Church Thoreau begin, begins her autobiography by saying, you know, I almost didn't make it here because my mama tried to kill herself when she was pregnant. So she names a multi-generational history that challenges this idea that black women, like, it's like, yes, black girls are magic and also they've struggled and shit hurts. Yes. You know, and so it's important for me to say, like, it, six years writing this book took a lot out of me and I think the point is that I know from these women to take care of myself and I'm doing that, but also that part of the work of, of bridging that public-private divide is not making people think that the magic is that you don't ever get tired. Yes. Yeah. Amen to that. Shoot. I'm up here being tired. Um, so I'm gonna invite some more of my friends up. Come on, y'all. Oh, ladies, I'm gonna move. And really, this is just like for me to hang out with my friends and y'all get to watch. <laughs> um, Angela, you're here. Um, I also want to turn these chairs some because we don't need to be in a straight line. Brittany, can you turn yours a little bit? I'll make sure I can see everybody. There we go. So you have before you. Hi, y'all. Hi. Hey, hey, hold on, though. Yes, the bowing. We're up here like amen for us. Yes. Like we're just here to bear witness. Yes. We're just yes. here for the celebration. Yes. Like all your panels were like crying. I'm like, oh I'm like, I'm tired, Brittany. Listen, yeah. Sorry. This is, no, we're don't here. Apologize. <laughs> we don't be. No, hell no. We don't be all oh. real over here. <laughs> Please. This is my friend Angela Peoples. Um, there's lots to say about Angela. You may recognize her <laughs> from such. Photographs <laughs> with a lollipop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As 50, what does it say? Tell, uh, tell us what it uh, says. Don't forget white women voted for Donald Trump. Right, yeah. 53%, right? 53%. Um, she's also the director of Get Equal. And then we have Jessica Bird, who is a political strategist and founder of Three Point Strategies, which works at the intersection of racial justice and electoral politics. She's out here running black women to run for mayor and everything, <laughs> all the things we need to be running, because that's why we're here to tell y'all about how black women need to run everything. Mm -hmm. And then my, my dear friend, Sabrina Hersey Issa, who is a human rights technologist, and she works with startups and foundations. Yeah. Um, right, technologist. Yeah. We gotta get for you. the strategist. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna start with you, Angela. Um, hi. Me. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about what it means? So, so one of the things that Brittany talks about in her book is this um, way in which black women bring their bodies to bear for um, the work of black liberation. And I feel like the way that you show up as an activist is often involves like your physical self. Um, and I think that's a thing. So I'm, can you talk a little bit about that and what it means for you to be a black queer woman who is bringing yourself into your activism, bringing your whole self and your physical body into your, the activism you do? Yeah, um, thank you for that question, Nia, and thank you all for, for being here. You all look great. Um, yeah, the audience is, <laughs> the audience is fine as very, well. Very, very <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but I've been thinking about that question a lot, sort of in the context of um, sort of where we are and where I am in, in, the, in history. Right, so recognizing I'm 30, um, I have had a long life, of, not long life, a, uh, of my life, a lot of it has been doing organizing and activism work. Um, but thinking about sort of in this particular moment, what does it mean to feel, know that there are lots of things that are happening with my body, in my body, and, and as a first lady woman, there's this idea of like, be having children at this age. It's a misnomer, right? Like this is the time to do that. And um, also, like, I don't know what happens after 30. I feel like there's another sort of puberty-ish shift and your body changes. Anyways. <laughs> but I think that feeling much more aware of my body and the power that it holds, um, and also recognizing that even the women's march is a great example, right? I didn't go to the women's march to do a direct action. I didn't go to, I, I went probably to be a little bit petty, but also I, I carried the sign to be a little bit petty, but I also went because I live in DC, I've been here for 10 years, I experienced what, um, seeing the sort of Trump administration come in and like 
feeling like our city was being taken over, I had sort of hoped that I, I felt myself needing to be in a place where of, of being restored, re-energized, you know, sort of cared for. Um, and um, I didn't necessarily have that experience at the Women's March, but I also held the sign because I felt like just my presence, literally just me being there, was a direct action, was a disruption. Um, and it, it, sh it, it came forward to bear, right? Literally just me being there with this sign, the statement that was on my mind the whole, um, since, 20, since 11 o'clock on, on November <laughs> 2008, um, needing to bring that and needing, real, realizing that just with my body, I could carry that message that was a lot clearer than any word, any policy statement, any sort of um, even direct action that was going. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and Jessica, you are working with black women who are occupying political space, right? So they are running as candidates right now, um, which is both amazing and in some ways like kind of terrifying. Yeah. Um, can you talk about what that work has been like and what it's been like to, the experience, the experience both for you but also for the women who, um, whose campaigns you're helping with um, to run for public office right now? Yeah. Hi, Mia. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This Absolutely. is awesome. And just to be here with all of you. I was joking um, when we were in the green, green room, room before <laughs> um, that Chani, do y'all read Chani Nichols? Yes. yes. So um, <laughs> she, your life if you, you have to, you she, to read I read Chani. her horoscope religiously and she told me that this week, <laughs> was a really big week for me and that two like two months of hard work would come to, to blossom. Me too. We should talk about this. Okay. Oh my gosh. And so it really has. And I was having a moment in the audience where I was like, Chani was right, girl. So um, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I specifically work with black women who are running for office. And I like to say at the intersection of electoral politics and racial justice, because I don't just work with any black woman or any black people, I work with people who want to change the conditions of black people in their city and want to make sure that not only we stay alive, but that we lead really meaningful lives because our families deserve it. Um, so most of the women I work with are in places that I call uprising cities, so that have a, an incredible um, activist base that can serve as a like catalyzing force for that person and specifically non-traditional candidates to be elected. So I'm working in six mayoral races right now um, and all of those places are places where there have been an uprising uh, of people who are invested in having leadership that really loves them. Um, and, and part of the way that I wanted to answer this question because a lot of people ask me about ele electoral politics kind of in itself feels very respectable. And so I feel like the context that you've provided for us in this space, I really want to answer that about that respectability because my women are trapped in it. Um, so when black women run for office, we are not only at the intersection of race, gender, and class, but then we're asking them to tell other people to choose them. Mm -hmm. And so in a, an environment in which um, white, upper middle class, college educated men are the standard, and so what's happening, and, and most progressive organizations are very guilty of this, is it's asking them to become that version of white male political power. I mean, literally, we'll have conversations with black women candidates and say, cut your hair, you can't have yellow nail polish, the way that you say this is not like, change the way that you speak, right? Like, those are literal conversations that are happening. So that's happening behind the scenes, and so you can resist that as much as you want. And then, though, you have to be on the campaign trail. So the way the media writes about you is black single mother runs for United States Senate, not um, engineer, not civil rights attorney, not two-term sitting congresswoman. But the fact that she's unmarried and ra raised a child on her own is actually the leading thing. I've actually never once worked for a black woman. I've worked in 43, sta 43 states. Um, who wasn't in some way um, talked about in the media in a way that was, was, had asked her to be more respectable. I've never once worked with a black woman who in the media wasn't called um, angry, um, doesn't work well with others. Um, I worked on a, um, a mayor's race in St. Louis 
um, for Tashara Jones, who some of you may have been following, and um, who's incredible. And really, I mean, the, the whole race was colored by the fact that the St. Louis Post-Dispatch would not stop calling her mean. Mm -hmm. um, it, the whole race was colored by the fact that literally they printed that she didn't hug people long enough. And so I, I feel like, what? oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah, they were mean. Um, and so I do, I also want to answer um, that some of the races that I hope that you will continue to follow though, um, the only way that we change this is that we become the storytellers. Yep. That's the only way. I mean, I've thought about it a lot, like, right? The only thing that people who create a respectability narrative around us um, understand is winning. And, and when we break through it and tell our own stories. And so, um, which is why it's so important that you're in this world as well. Um, and so I want you to know that Stacey Abrams is running for governor yeah. of Georgia. Um, and she would be the first black woman governor in this entire country. Ooh. And that's not, and I want to be clear that's not an accident. Mm. I want to be clear that that's not an accident. Um, the way that we, we move up a process of elected leadership is we get stuck because of this narrative, these narratives. And we have, we have a responsibility to lift her outside of the way that people see power in this country. That means that we have to talk about her. We have to tell her story. We have to talk about her in the framework that we understand and in language that our people can feel connected to because she's not going to get a fair shake, y'all. Just because you're excited about her or someone on your timeline is doesn't mean that she's going to get a fair shake. And so we have to be very vigilant about the way that we allow women who we want to serve us to be sucked in this vacuum of respectability. Oh. Hi, Mia. Hi, Hi Ben. So um, what are you seeing right now when it comes to investing in black women's leadership? And where are you seeing people get it? And where mm. are they not getting it? Okay. Well, it's amazing that you led with seeing because I just want to start by saying thank you because while we were sitting there sobbing in the front row, I was thinking to myself, like, I feel so seen right now. Yes. Like, in this space, right in this dialogue, these conversations, the, this, these experiences. So thank you for, for that. Um, well, I will say, I work in technology, um, and it... <laughs> Who's, who's doing it right? It's a small list. <laughs> it's lonely. They say it's lonely at the top. But, um, and it's a couple things. Like I'm, what I'm observing in my industry right now is that there is a tension. And right now, we all want to say that, you know, and, and, and say that we're, we're an industry that's about doing the most good. But no one is actually talking about doing less harm. And when we talk about disruption in the innovation lexicon, we're not actually talking about the violence that comes with that um, and the lives that we're upending with that and that the fact that it actually doesn't have to be this way. Um, and the people who I see who are approaching technology holistically um, that are centering the lives of people who our products and services are are they're using are black women entrepreneurs. And so those are the ones that are getting it right, but those are also the ones that are the least resourced in our mm -hmm. space. And they have been creating a way out of no way since the beginning of time. And I think what we're seeing now in, in the industry and in this space, with the fact that the markets are tightening, there's not as much capital as there used to be, um, and people are going to have to be um, inventive and resourceful in a way where black women in the back of the room was like, we've been here for a minute. <laughs> welcome, <laughs> welcome. Um, and so this conversation about not just doing the most good, but doing less harm is really beginning to become um, centered in how we're talking about building products. And that is what I'm really excited about um, in the space because I truly believe that technology has a role in solving social, justices, social justice issues, the most pressing social justice issues of our time, if we are willing to meet this moment right now. Um, the people who are stepping up to that challenge are the ones who are most directly impacted by injustices and by um, our rights being taken away. And we can't ignore them because our numbers are only growing, especially in this administration right now. Um, so in, in this context uh, of like being able to tell our stories, um, 
technology is writing the next, like the, our next chapter of history. And so it is up to all of us to step up to that plate and be a part of not just content producers, but, con but uh, product creators. Mm -hmm. And so the people who are doing it well are organizations like Black Girls Code. I mean, they have really created a space that centers the ex not just um, the experiences of black girls, but also the fact that like all of us can be a part of creating inclusive solutions um, for the products that we use every single day. And so all of this is what I'm talking about, the fact that women of color and black women are the least resourced entrepreneurs, but the ones that are producing the most results in the marketplace. It's something that is finally getting talked about more and more in spaces as the people who are holding power in these rooms are finally seeing. And so me being in venture capital offices, like my physical presence changes the conversation. Like they can't be as openly racist <laughs> as they would normally be. But it is, a, it is this thing about our physical, our physicality of being in the rooms, like being in these rooms matter. And I can't opt out. Um, and uh, of that conversation. And then the other thread that I'm pulling in terms of respectability is the fact that the Harvard, the glorized white guy who dropped out of Harvard, like that doesn't translate if you're a black woman mm -hmm. in tech. Nope. And um, that is also something where like the pattern matching of a successful looking CEO. Yeah, I mean, right. yeah. I have two degrees. Yeah, exactly. I speak, I speak yes. five <laughs> languages. I, I speak five languages. I have three degrees. And mm -hmm. I'm still mistaken for um, caterers in these venture capitalist offices. And it's one of those things where I, I will never get to wear the hoodie. Like, like I will never yes. get to wear the hoodie. But I'm in the room driving the conversation to drive resources to entrepreneurs that are really going to shape our future. And that is what matters to me the most. So yeah, I'll take your microaggression, I'll remember it, <laughs> timestamp it in the future, serve it back to you later. <laughs> yes. Because I'm playing in the long game. Yes. <laughs> I'm yes. absolutely playing. The, and like one of the long games that I, I'm excited about right now, so um, in, this, in this space, where we need to tell our next stories, but like our timeline is only one iteration of these storytelling vehicles. And right now, a one in space that's really exciting is like then virtual reality, artificial reality, machine learning, the fact that half the room probably has Pokemon Go on your phone right now. And like who's shaping those products? Because that is going to only be the beginning of like how we're telling our stories. And I want women of color and black women specifically to be in the room, to be the, be the engineers coding these solutions. And so talking about um, one of the programs my company runs is called Immersive Impact, which is basically like embedding people of color into these like emerging technology fields. And having these conversations in these rooms where you know, they're delivering millions of dollars to Harvard dropouts and hoodies and talking about how actually we can drive those same resources to women of color who are telling incredible, like they're, they're telling incredible stories on YouTube and be like, wouldn't this be great as a 360 video experience? Mm -hmm. And like, I have to bridge that gap and be the translator and like walk them through that. And so the list of people who are getting it right are very short, but right now what I'm excited about is that it, we only have, it can only grow. Right. Yeah. So basically black women are getting black it right. Black women are getting it right, okay. <laughs> as yeah. per usual. Um, so I have one more question for y'all before we open it up to y'all, including apparently Twitter. Um, they're asking questions too. Um, so, Brittany, you talked about being tired. Yeah. Um, we've all talked about like different Every ways in which like our um, <coughs> the visibility that that the work we're doing requires um, is uh, can be painful because it makes us targets, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are each of you doing to take care of yourselves? because I know that the other black women who are here and listening. <laughs> no, this is, why, this is why I'm asking, because I feel like, yes, there's a whole like, self-care conversation, but um, I want to know like, what, what actually um, brings you joy and renewal in your life, like, because you all are very uniquely positioned as black women leaders, and the rest of us need to hear this. Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot, because I think that the self care conversation has like like all things that we just start to abuse like yes. yeah. what are you doing for your self care you know and people will send me a text like i saw you're running on, you know running on another th plane you know what are you doing i'm like a manicure for me is not self care no and so i feel like when people ask like 
think that that's a measurement of whether I'm okay or not, I actually mm -hmm. deeply love my work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it actually is a reason why I'm single and I struggle. Like I love, I wake up in the morning on my own at 7 a.m. by, I have some rules around when I can get started. I have to, I'm not, I have to eat breakfast before I can look at my email, that's my rule. By 7.15. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up, I literally take an hour break and then I work till 2 a.m. And I, I love it. And that's not for everybody, right. but it's for me. It really is, at least for a few more years. Um, and um, the things that fuel me, though, are like deep, loving connections yes. with yes. my friends. Yep. Um, I have a best friend um, who is my person. She is my person in this world. Um, she is my soulmate. And she feeds me. Um, and her seeing me, truly seeing me, and that, I feel like visibility, however we're defining mm -hmm. that, has brought that closer to me. Yes. That she, ne she doesn't care about the extra stuff, and I think that that's important. Um, I also do think that part of this like refueling piece as a leader, if what we're asking for is like how to deepen this, is for the first time ever a funder in a conversation um, asked me, so I know people, like they talk about your work, they talk about how they can fund your work, like how do I, what do you need? What's your skill, what, what part of your skill set do you need? Mm -hmm. And I realized that even though I've been working on campaigns for like 13 years, um, I've never gotten management coaching and I'm expanding my firm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so she said, can I fund your leadership coaching? Wow. And so now I have executive leadership coaching that someone else is paying for. Mm -hmm. And I've actually never said that publicly, but like I, that is so yep. awesome that someone said to me, okay, I don't want to just give you money to do more work. I want you to be around for a while, and I want you to be a good manager, and I want you to duplicate yourself. And so that, for me, those both ands yeah. have been really important. Mm -hmm. nice. um, yeah, I think, uh, so part of that for me is when you were speaking, um, Dr. Cooper, about the, the uh, sort of like toll on their lives and their families, I thought, you know, about how important it is to like create joy, but also like really remember and celebrate and like hold it. I find that, um, especially going like from weekend to weekend, conference to plane to whatever, that there's actually a lot of great magical moments in my life. Um, I I was at the um, Black Youth Project 100 National Conven Convening Conference last weekend, um, and just doing the hustle with a big group of black, young black folks to Frankie Beverly and Maze was like literally, I want to remember this feeling forever. Yeah. And like, and it, not just because it's a hustle and it's Frankie Beverly and Maze, but like every, the, 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 the yes. feeling, the energy yes. in the room was that everyone was having that same exact moment. They're like, I want to remember this forever. And I think that it's easy to go from thing to thing and like, oh, that was a cool conference and oh, someone said that. But, <clears throat> or even just like the one-on-one -on -one conversations. This week has been, I've been doing a lot of work around some of the pride stuff with a campaign called No Justice, No Pride here in DC. Um, and there's been a lot of like mean things that have been said about me by white gay men. It's okay, it happens all the time. But it's not okay, it does happen all the time. Okay. I'm used to it, is, is what I'm Because we can say. fight. Oh, okay. Right? <laughs> um, I'll put you in the army. There's, there's, a, there's a growing I'm having but, a fight. I was, I was kind of having a couple of days where I was like kind of just stuck in the like uh, hurt and anger and frustration oh. of those conversations. And then um, one of our, uh, the field organizers that um, worked with Get Equal in North Carolina sent me a screenshot of them um, uh, practicing some of the recruitment uh, tactics that we talked about oh. and it being really effective. And I was like, oh right, so none of this shit, excuse mm -hmm. me, matters. Mm -hmm. This matters. We can curse them here. Just and, so you okay, know. great. It's my, it's my this house right is now. what matters, and this is the stuff that I need to like fill myself up with. Yeah. And when those, when I do get tired, yeah. um, being really, really intentional about like going to the places and the folks and the people um, that give me that life and the juice. And can I just say one more yes. thing? Also, having people like Jessica and Sabrina and Brittany and Mia and so many other folks that I know are fighting just as hard and struggling just as much. And when I see them, I could be like, girl, and they're like, girl. <laughs> and we, like, knowing that those folks are there and building those relationships, just, it, it's invaluable. And I don't know how we can 
we I don't know if we slide that into the nonprofit yeah. industrial complex, <laughs> but um, it is something that just has to be um, a part of how we do this social change work um, forever if we're going to be able to sustain ourselves, especially as black women. My friend calls it micro affirmation. Yes, oh, yes. Nice. That, like, you know, when you see someone in the hall, you're like, the <laughs> nod, the nod. Yes. Hey. Yeah. I yes. see you. Or, like, when you come into a meeting, you're like, girl, you look so good, you know? Which is what we did. Exactly. Like, like, yes. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to answer my own question, then I'm going to let Sorry. you two go. Okay. So, just, just the thing you said a second ago about, like, um, these white men saying hurtful things about you, and, like, you're, it's okay because you're used to it. So we get that shit all the time, and we have to get used to it because yeah. we can't mm -hmm. fall down on the floor every time it happens. Yeah. But when we do that, like, it, you know, it's these little, like, internal, like, slices to our art. So I had this experience um, in Boston last week where I was part of this um, panel of people of color, and this white woman asked us some stuff, and we answered her, and she was like, but, but, but. <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> and then in the hall, I was talking to this brother. This woman came up to me and said, do you have a minute? Nope. And I said, no. And she said, because. Aww. And I'm like, when you ask me, do I have a minute? Actually That's not, I'm like, she said, because. So then she proceeded to explain herself again and say, you know, I don't think you understood me. And I said, no, I understood you. I just disagreed with you. And she yep. said, but I don't think, and I was like, no. So, and, and as she was coming up, this brother who I was talking to, I said to him, I said, I need you to stay here. And he rooted himself next to me. We had our little interaction, and I turned to him and he said, thank you for showing up with your truth. And I started weeping, yep. weeping. And then he just held me and I cried for like 30 seconds. And he was just saying over and over again in my ear, like, thank you for showing up, thank you for being beautiful, thank you for being strong. Like over and, and, I, was, and I realized after that, like I basically just like released that whole experience. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't walking around with that like resentment and that, and it's the invisibility, right? It's the invis. It's the like she was not seeing yeah. me, but he totally saw me, mm. and 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 reflected to me that he saw me. Mm. So I didn't have that thing, and I was like, I just want to go around like looking for instances, like a superhero where I just like see some fucked up shit happen with like <laughs> well, black yeah. women, and I just go and I'm like, I'm yeah. like, I want to hug you. Do you need to cry? And I can just tell you how awesome you are. <laughs> She does uh, that, by the way. She does that <laughs> <laughs> regularly. Yeah. I mean, that was like yeah. why I wanted y'all to come here, yeah. right? Yeah. So that that thing, and I just uh, part of what I what I what I I think is like we don't we don't stop when those things happen, and mm -hmm. because we can't, there's often it's not safe to like feel whatever it is, and we gotta like go get on a plane or get on a phone call or whatever. Um, but I just think about like what it would mean if we if we had more moments where we could just release those things and then move on and like how much less we'd be carrying. Well, it's not just like the visibility. Like with the visibility comes a vulnerability. Yes. Yeah. And she didn't just not see you, she saw you, but she didn't see you as a full human yes. who deserves to be heard and respected and like exactly. like the bound. And in it and it is if I could like zoom out and zoom in, it's kind of goes into like women of color who are running for office right now. Mm -hmm. When we are like the way I'm kind of like looking at the land of the era we're living in with 45, it's that this is an outcome that none of us expected. We're going to have to go about addressing it in a way that none of us have done before. And yes, there are all of these calls for people to, to run for office. But there is an increased cost when it's women of color and black women who are running for office that white men do not have to pay. Yeah. And are we ready? Like, and not all of them are going, they're going to run because we show up. But they're not all going to win. So on the other side of winning, when they lose, are we there? Are we going to be there yeah. to, with systems and structures and networks of support to lift them back up again? Yeah. And that is something I want, like in terms of like my like a a activist life, like I want to help our losers. Like I want to, I want to, because there is no way, there's no reason why that shouldn't be the case. When white men startups fail, like they immediately kind of slide into cushy like entrepreneur and residence positions. Like that's not a yep. real job. Um, <laughs> like, and when uh, you know like m white dudes challenge and lose in primary challenges, like they slide into positions at think tanks. But like we don't have those networks of support for black women and women of color who are running for office. And I want to like we need to talk later. We need to talk I'm some like, more <laughs> after this. But like, so that's the zoom out of like the vulnerability and the visibility. The zooming in is like, personally, I've like realized that like, I've already been through a lot in my life. Like this has kind of just reinforced the resilience I've built in and like affirmed that like, 
you can come out, you know how to do hard things, and you can come out the other side of this, whatever the other side is gonna look like. Um, and I have said this repeatedly, and I think I've even said it to you before, is that, is that in this time, it, is, it has been very educational to me, and I've been like, okay, I'm gonna ruthlessly love and support the people who ruthlessly love and support me, and I'm gonna be ruthlessly dismissive of everybody else. <laughs> like, to the point of like trolling them. I'm like, you think I care? I don't. Like, <laughs> And so like that's been really clarifying for me. It's like these are my people. This is what matters. This is the work that fills me up because I do. I love what I get yeah. to do and I think I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be a part of shaping the future. And I don't ever want to take that for granted. Yeah. But I also want and deserve to be a full whole person and as well. And so also like I just I also realize like I like hanging out with people who are too young to vote. So I've been hanging out a lot with like children they're cool you know <laughs> it's like I've been seeing my family a lot and like cooking and like going on really dope vacations and like doing it all for the insta and it's been <laughs> so great and I hate to say I'm like super happy like sorry if you guys are in the struggle but like I'm great <laughs> like, <laughs> that's amazing but yeah so that's like joy dream. like joy is my right it yes. is not yeah. like something that I'm not gonna like forfeit Word. Yeah, I don't think I have it figured out as well. Um, so I'll say that, so I, you know, I typically tell people I have a therapist, a pastor, an acupuncturist, uh, an astrologer, um, a personal trainer. Like I have all of the things, you know, to sort of think about all of these different parts of my life. Um, and I'm really intentional about, you know, getting massages and, you know, going to sit on the therapist's sofa uh, and all of those sorts of things, and going to church and trying to have a spiritual practice so that I don't kill people and, you know, <laughs> things of that Important. nature, right? Um, a little bit. But I, but I also have some challenges around the limits of self-care because I live alone. I live thousands of miles away from my family. I'm an only child, like, you know, and so th those are really hard kind of moments. My superpower is that, you know, I find homegirls wherever I go, and so I have a great kind of homegirl network um, that's really, really dope and that holds me down. And so, you know, but sometimes when folks are like, well, self-care, I'm like, well, I'm tired. Literally on Monday, I finished another book and submitted it, and it'll be out next year. So, thank you. But the thing about that is everyone is like, oh, because black girls are magic. And it's like, but when I said I was tired, but that's what I meant. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know, all of that extra work and demand. Because the thing is, when you are really tight, then people just keep on asking you to do stuff. Yes. And so I have a no coach that I call because I have a problem <laughs> telling people no. So, yeah. I, so, so I have a homegirl yes. that I call and I'm like, so I need to say no to this, but I'm going to say yes because I have a problem. And she's like, <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll write the email for you. I'll write the text message for you. And then she like sends it to me and then I can send it or whatever. Or we can talk about it and oh. she can help me to understand why I need to say no even though I feel compelled, right, to say yes. And so helping, getting people around you that can help you with your weaknesses. Um, but look, I think the thing, the place that I'm in at 36 is the place of like, okay, so I have a really dope career. And now what? Right, and, and how do I build the kind of family that I want? And I keep telling folks that I don't feel like I have, I know how to have an amazing career because I've trained my whole life for it, mm. right? And when you're a working class black girl that's the first, right, to make it, to get degrees, to get out, to do, then you, you get, you figure out that piece of it, but I don't know that I figured out the literacy around building relationships and building family. Mm. Um, and so I feel like I'm stumbling and bumbling through that part of my life in this moment, but. But the commitment I've made to myself is that as scary as it is that I'm showing up to that, that that's part of my self-care. Mm. That the thing that I know is that I don't want to come home to live with myself forever, and I really like living with myself, <laughs> right? But it's one thing to know that at 36 when your career is hot and popping. It's another thing when you're like 50, though, and things are, look different, and you may want a partner. And so I think black girls should prioritize also. It's not the thing people tell us because we're magic. But I think we should prioritize thinking as robustly about what kind of family and partnership and kinship networks we need. So that's why I invest in my girls. I talk to them every day. I have lots of homegirls. I talk to most of them. We have different threads. We check in every day. Um, 
they show up for me even when raggedy Negroes are not showing up. Um, and, you know, I mean, because y'all know what it is. And so, you know, so they show up. And so I cultivate those relationships, like, because they are family. Um, and then, you know, but I also just feel like we have to be honest in saying that it's, that it's not all neat and pretty, that yes, I wrote a book, yes, I have another book coming out, but there are other parts of my life that I haven't figured out because I invested all of my time and energy in becoming this person, right, the sort of public person and the writer and the thinker. And now I have to figure out how to let somebody love me and how to show up and love somebody else, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I'm actively figuring that out and, be, and, and really screwing it up and calling my girls and being like, but we said this and I don't know what it means. <laughs> and so please help me. What does it mean? Like, what do I do now? Like, so that's also happening, yeah. you know? Um, and I, you know, so I want to be really, I think, it's important for us to be transparent. The other thing that I think I will say to y'all that I'm sort of working out, case in point, yesterday, I had a, you know, so I have this, so look, I, I'm part of Black Lives Matter. I think that I'm a radical black feminist. You know, I was a Hillary Clinton supporter during the election. I say that because, it, what, because my radical young black folks who are a few years younger have all the problems with it. So we've been having these skirmishes with each other whenever I say this stuff online. Right, and so one of the challenges that I'm working through in this moment is feeling like, even though I've written books and hundreds of articles online, whenever we're in a moment where we're not just seeing polarized, polarization on the right, mm -hmm. where people are doubling down and, and digging in, we're also seeing it on the left. And there's a way where the thing that I worry about with young people who are under 30 is that they throw those of us who are just slightly over 30 away. It's like, y'all aren't woke, y'all are old, and you don't know. And, it's, and, and, and so, what, so yesterday, my pastor called because I was having one of these interactions where people were dragging me. I had a lot of young sisters being like, you just caving for the Clintons. You just, and I was like, the Clintons? Like, the Clintons who don't like black people? Like, whose legacy of policy? Like, you know, and, and it was hard because I was like, but, but have you read my body of work? <laughs> and then I realized that the reason that I was so passionate about black women's bodies of work is because the people threw Mary Church Terrell away because they thought that she was so respectable and snooty that there was nothing that she had to offer, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, there's a risk when we need people to meet every criteria that we have and we throw them away when they don't, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so I've been dealing with the hurt of that, right? It hurts my feelings, right? I think that's important to say because in a hyper-digital yes. moment, yeah. I don't need folks to agree with me, but I need people to know that I am flesh and blood and a human yeah. being. Yeah. And then I do this work because I actually love black people and yes. I want to see us get free, yes. right? And so this is my way to do it, and that means I don't always get the thinking right, but the love and the passion and the commitment is always there. And so we got to figure out a way to have disagreements with each other about, the, about ideas, about the ideas that will get us free without questioning people's commitment to the struggle, yes. Yes. right? Um, and so, and look, that, because that's a way that we can care for each other. We might not be able to, because I know that the list of things that I listed that I do to care for myself are also reflective of the fact that I have a very good job. Mm -hmm. And that everybody is not in a position economically to be able to do all of those things. But one of the things we can do is show up and be empathetic. And the thing that I said to people is during the election, most of my girls didn't agree with me. They were like, no girl, we just don't understand. But they love me and they ride for me yep. because right. their love for me is not predicated on political agreement. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, and so we, I was like, so we figured out how to just had a conversation about where we were, and them saying, be like, be you good? Like, what do you need? And when people step to me crazy, them being like, be you good, or we need to roll? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so that's a way when we're talking about care, not just as an individualist project, but as a community project, yes. that what yes. I would say to this group is, please let us not throw each other away. Yeah. It's really important. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. I know that we're, I That's all right. Go ahead. We're um, gonna run late, y'all, because be black. So sorry. Yeah. <laughs> be cool. Um, it I, that brought up so much for me, and I love, I love, I loved it. But um, I was also just thinking too about you digging through archives, right, of these women, and that people will like dig through our tweets to know us, yeah. us, yeah. as in all of us, mm -hmm. and how that adds to this idea of vulnerability, public vulnerability, and. Um, and branding, and I feel like it's what's really hard is that knowing that I'm gonna change, like I'm very clear that I change a lot. Yes. You know, like if I would, I'm so glad that I wasn't much into Facebook when I was like 20, and like didn't have the language or the analysis 
and, and I also know that even in a year, I'm going to have more than mm -hmm. I have now. Yeah. And to think that I have to be married to some of the things that even I say or feel is really, I, I feel a lot of anxiety around it. And then I also want to say something connected but um, not, um, not married is um, I do think queerness, so I identify as queer, and I think that queerness has brought an expanded version of the way that I think about family and community mm -hmm. that's such a gift. Um, because I feel like there was a time when I would think about this marker of my life of 30 or 35 or whatever, and I would think very clearly about like these steps. I feel like queerness has, has just expanded and deepened everything about my life that says that I actually don't need to live in binaries at all, yeah. and that like actually at 30 could be my own renaissance, or mm -hmm. like could be, or 40 could be, or that I could always, I think queerness for me says I can always change my mind. Um, and that I get to be whatever I want to be. And so um, I feel like that you brought that up for me when I when you're thinking about community and what you think, what you need. And I think that when we think about a community of care, it actually doesn't have to be an intimate partner. Um, it really can be um, people that you choose. Like you get to just choose who's, who's in your life. Yeah. The structures of like, the binary structures of like family and like these are the people who take care of us and da da da. We didn't make that. Like that was, no. that was a, con that's a construct. Yeah. And so we get to remake the, like our world and our communities and what care is and what, what love is. So and black yeah. folks have never done that. I was about yeah. to say, we've always been remaking yeah, it. That's yeah. right. These that's expansive right. ideas of family. And I mean, I know probably all y'all got an auntie or uncle who is not related to your parents. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, well, so. Also just like the violence of like the single family home and like the yeah. destruction that, that actually ripped up Single family homes actually ruined actual communities. Right. Uh, there's this incredible talk I saw of um, uh, someone taking aerial photos of prisons where there's one entrance in and one entrance out, and then they juxtaposed it next over um, McMansion neighborhoods where there's one entrance in and one an entrance out, and, you, and he's mixed them up. And he's like, tell me which was which, wow. and you could not tell. Wow. Like th that is not natural. That is that is that is not that is not love. Um, so yeah, let's like rip it all down, burn it all down, and start anew. <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> yes. All right, so we're going to turn it to y'all, and I'm going to oh, let yeah. you know right now I'm prioritizing the black women who have questions over here, so. Because <laughs> yes. right now it's my house. On loan, on loan, but it's mine right now. Yes. First? Uh, but speaking, oh. yeah, we want to hear you. Hi, thank you. First of all, I just want you to know as an older auntie, how beautiful it is to see you all up there. Yeah. And I, I took my time in saying that because you are a convergence of all different aspects of where we're trying to go in this new millennia and how we're trying to recreate our country with a multicultural aspect. But I'm curious, do you all look back at aunties like me and say, come on, do you have those experiences? Do you invite our knowledge or our experience because we may not have all the letters behind our names mm. like you do? So. so I think I'm the oldest up here. Um, I'm 44. I mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and just blow it. So I, I put myself mama. a little bit I in the <laughs> <laughs> category. <laughs> I love it. Um, so I'm going to let y'all answer that question. Yes. I mean, um, y'all bring me along, so I feel like I ain't got no, 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 no. You bring us along. Like, those yeah. experiences, like sharing your lives and telling your stories, like that informs how I, and shapes how I see, see the world. Like I'm an auntie to literally little kids, but my, like I, I you know, being able to be a purview to sit on the shoulders of my grandmother and my 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 aunties, like it is, it has helped me do, like show up in the world as a better citizen, as a better human. It has helped me do my job better. I one of the proudest professional uh, thing, achievements I've I've had was, you know, I took my grandmother to go vote in her first democratic election ever. She, my family's from Somalia, so she became a citizen in time to vote in 2012 for Barack Obama. <laughs> <laughs> And I got to go and take her to the polls. My grandmother's also 4'11", so she like fits in my pocket, oh. you know? And I took her to the polls, and I went to go translate for her, and because she doesn't speak English, she's not, she's like, whatever, I'm a million years old, I'm not learning English. 
but I'm going to vote for Barack Obama. <laughs> and so I had to go and translate for her. And, um, and this is very vulnerable. She doesn't read or speak English. And I show up at the polls, and they're like, cool, you're going to translate for her. You have to sign this very legal document that says she's not paying you, and you don't work for her. And I was like, wait a minute, let me get this straight. She doesn't speak or read English, and you, I'm going to sign this, and I'm going to have her sign this document, legal document in, in English. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that doesn't make any sense. But she, she did it, and she, her signature was just an X. And it, it brought me back to like mm. the time when we had to do poll t yeah. tests and stuff like that. Um, we were leaving. A bunch of people from our mosque were also rolled up. And I was like, yo, do you guys hear about this weird thing you have to do? And I translated for my grandmother, but then I also stayed and I translated for other people from my mm -hmm. mosque who were going through. A couple of months later, I'm with a good friend of mine, uh, Samala, who you know, and I'm telling her this experience. She is, was the ED of an Asian American civil, digital civil rights organization called 18 Million Rising. And she's like, actually, this is a massive problem. Like, the UX of our democracy is broken. And like, this conversation rolled into, like, we speak a language that connects us to our older generation. Um, they need access to civic services that are not, in systems that are not designed for them. How can we pair volunteer translators with people, our aunties, our grandmothers, and like have this like dialogue at our kitchen tables that make them full participants in our democracy? That conversation evolved into a product that's called VoterVox that got activated this last election cycle. Yeah. So like, yes, I'm here for all of that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say that um, I think I'm in a place where I absolutely need more sort of aunties. And I think it's, I think both, not just sort of where I am in my life, but particularly around where I am in my trajectory as an organizer, as a social change um, activist, like this question about, you know, hearing, hearing a lot from, um, you know, OGs or elders or even you know folks that are sort of in between um, about how they're sort of fighting the same fights that we are, it's very disheartening for me. And so I need to be in more community with folks who did this, you know, especially working in the LGBT community around like trying to push around race and class and gender. It's like We've been having this conversation for about 25 years now. I sure as hell can't have it for another 25 years. Yeah. And so being able to be connected to and rooted to more people, more black women who have done, been a part of this struggle in various ways and knowing how and why they stuck through it and why they sustained it and having them articulate back to um, Barbara Ramsey was at the BYP National Convention last year or last weekend. Um, and the, she closed and she said, um, I want to tell you why we love you. And not just like we love you because you're black and you're brilliant, but we love you because you're living this legacy. You're doing, like naming back to us what the progress is. Because we're out here in you know, Facebook like, ah, everything's awful. And like having you know, folks dictate that's like, actually, yes, awful. And let's add some context, let's add some layers. Yeah. Um, to, re to help you recognize that we are moving forward um, and also modeling what it looks like to have this full, expansive vision of being, uh, uh, being a black woman and a scholar and a mother and all, and, and all of the things in, in between. Having that as a model is like super, super important for me right now and I need more of it. Any aunties you know, out here looking for nieces, I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, and I... My, my answer is just so yes. I mean, all the candidates I work with are much older than I am. Um, but also, y'all know who runs civic engagement. It's black women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They run our churches. They run every volunteer outreach. So they definitely run the campaign office. Mm -hmm. They're my boss. And they make good mac and cheese. And like, that's my whole world. So <laughs> yes, I listen, for sure. Let me, let me say two things. One is, so my mom has three sisters, and my dad had four sisters. So I have actual aunties yeah. who are just in my life, who are just, you know, messing, you know, calling me up. Well, you know, I mean, doing everything from being like, well, I don't understand how to post a thing on Facebook <laughs> so that, you know, and I'm like, what is going on? So, yes, I thought, you know, or, but also, so my, you know, so I think of my, you know, my growing up as being growing, literally growing up in that sort of community of women that we talk about, my single mama, my grandmama, my aunties. Um, and 
what I love about the auntie, my aunties and my, grand, my grandmother when she was living is that they're the people in my life who hold me accountable to having a full life. So what they do, you know, so my, you know, my aunt called me, she said, I mean, she called me like two months ago and said, let me tell you about, you know, when I went to the club the other night and they started shooting, she's 67. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. So I was like, well, what's happening? Absolutely. You know what I mean? <laughs> she, you know, and she was like, well, I should have known when they had plastic cups that it wasn't the right place. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, okay. So I feel like oh, what I love about that is that I have a really long generational view of what it means to be happy, what it means to be intentional, and all these ways my life can look, and I cherish that. Um, what I will say on the, but I also hear the thing around like, do you have people in your life who don't have all the letters and stuff, but do you see them as valuable? And yeah. yes, and the reason why that's important to me to say is because I'm the only one in my family with all these letters, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm still connected to those folks, and they are the people who pray for me. Yep. When white boys are like, we don't know about your work and your this and your that, you know, my mama just calls me and said, baby, you got this. You smart as anybody in the room. You can have it. You can do it. And I talk to the Lord, and it's going to be done. You know what I mean? <laughs> and every black girl needs your version of whoever yes. will do that for you. Yes. And so I keep people in my life who I know yeah. that when I am tired, I can call them and they're like, well, baby, I've been praying for you, you know, and you're going to be all right. And sometimes you just need the people who knew you before you were all of those yes, things, yes, yes, yes. right? And so, yes, I believe in that. What, the other thing I want to say, though, is, and this is, you know, the place that I'm working through at 36 when I learned, like, in the last two, three years that I'm old now or whatever, and I feel some type of way about it, <laughs> is like, I don't like it when young folks in the movement who are not my actual nieces and nephews or my nieces and nephews via auntie. friends who call me auntie. Ah. I don't actually like that. It feels ageist to me. <laughs> I've had people do it, and I don't appreciate it. And so what I would like to be in that instance is a big sister. Uh, and yeah. I don't know what happened to big sisterdom. <laughs> But I would hope that we could <laughs> reclaim that. That's amazing. Yeah. I love it. Meanwhile, right, I'm like, I'm here. I'm no you and then you. I want to say thank you, Pastor. You have all of the kids. Yeah. 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 You are in, you are in my crew. You just don't know it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I want to ask you about the classroom. So we know all about kind of your public scholarship. We know about writing your books. Um, but someone in the academy, I'd be interested in hearing you talk about how you're also managing showing up in the classroom. I show up and teach two classes every semester. I teach a full load at Rutgers. Um, you know, I teach a range of classes, everything from, I do a lot of work around gender and technology for Rutgers because of the Crunk Feminist blog. So I teach in our gender and media minor. I teach graduate seminars in feminist theory, all of that. Uh, and then I teach uh, black intellectual thought, all these, all these different kinds of things. Um, and the classroom is the reason that I became a professor. I became a professor because I wanted to be a teacher. It's one of the favorite parts of my job. Um, you know, I get to connect. And look, I see my classroom as a space of liberation. I feel like when I walk into the room, you know, I'm not the kind of graduate instructor that is there to intimidate students and make them feel like they can't do the work. I don't see my graduate seminars as a weeding out process. Yeah. So it means that I spend a lot of time in my seminars telling sisters in my seminars that they can do it. And then when they come to my office and they cry, and that happens a lot, I sometimes just have to be the person that says, you're smart enough, you're good enough, you have the skills to do this, because academe is a really violent place. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm so invested in claiming the mantle of black feminism is because it is the place where I learned the language that said to me that how black women live is theory. We, our living and thriving and the way that we think about what it means to creatively move through the world means we are always theorizers, right? That's Barbara Christian's work. But also, you know, it was black feminist theorists who taught me, like I will never forget the moment when I read Alice Walker's definition of womanism in a seminar and she started with the word womanish because my grandmama had called me that a million times. And I didn't know that the stuff my grandmother said could become a theory of something. Mm -hmm. And that was revolutionary to me. First, I gave a side eye to it because I was like, this is whack. I don't know about you. I don't know about this. That's interesting. Because there's a way that we don't even concede that black women are authority. Yes. Even black yeah. women yeah. don't yes. do it, right? And so part of what I see my work in the academy is doing, 
you know, I feel like I'm an interloper there. I'm there to steal resources for our people, right? I'm there to help every black kid that I meet, every kid of color that I meet, because I work in New Jersey. We have a large um, Latina pop Latino population, right? Any kid of color that's in my class, I, look, I teach everybody who comes through the door. What I hope is to give white kids a transformative way to look at the world, because I know that they will have a significant amount of power. And what I hope that my students of color feel is heard and seen, yeah. right? And then I hope that, and then, you know, and then when I'm in graduate seminars and I'm training black women, what I'm trying to do is add people to the black girl mafia. Like, that's all <laughs> that I'm trying to do. We need more people, right? And I want them to know that they can do it and that they're tight. And it makes me really mad when they come and tell me that they sat in a seminar and people were talking about bullshit, right, and calling it theory and telling them it was relevant. And I was like, what people were doing was they were talking about the ways in which white men have understood the world. Mm -hmm. And the reason that that feels violent and irrelevant to you is because they're trying to make something that is deeply particular universal, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm just telling you that so that you know that your theoretical work is also deeply particular, but it has universal implications because the real talk is that what my book shows, the work that we're all doing shows, is that how black women think about the world, because it is so fundamentally democratic, right? It is so fundamentally yes. a world that is about the inclusion of as many people as we yes. can mm -hmm. with as little harm as possible. Mm -hmm. It's our shit that actually changes the world. Yeah. Not their shit. to run everything. Yeah. Let us run it. Just give it to us. All right. We can do wow. it. You were next. That was just riff. Okay. That was just We're going to get a transcript or something. Yeah. No. I had the page in the book that I wanted to read, oh, wow. but then you got all deep, and I was like, oh, I need to write this down. <laughs> um, no, it, it's a part in the book where you quoted Ab, uh, Ebony Magazine's special issue oh, on the problems of the Negro woman. I love the quote, because I feel like it's uh, very relevant. Um, and the quote just says, uh, problems of the Negro woman intellectual, that was the title. It began with this observation, the Negro woman intellectual is easily one of the most misunderstood, underappreciated, problem-ridden of all God's creatures. In fact, if we, if, if it were left to many Negro males alone to decide, she would not even exist. So with that, the question that I have for you is, with, this, with the whole idea of uh, the politics of respectability in, being in academia, how do you get to write about what you want to write about when you're already challenged, like contested space in academia? Um, I get some input from like, oh, after you get your PhD, write about what you want to write about. After you get tenure, then write about what you want to write about. After you get full, so how do you uh, exist in that space, be legitimate in that space, and also create content that's consumable to a larger audience? Yeah, yeah. So, so what I'm going to say is not a, a easy answer, but it is the answer. I did double work. Um, so one, I rejected the idea that I was going to get radical after tenure. I don't think that that's true. Um, I think that you, if you're committed, then you do it now. But here's the thing, and this is the hard part. So we live in a moment where everyone is really um, deeply obsessed with having a platform because you can have one now at the click of a button. Um, and so everyone is like, well, I need to write for the public and whatever. And what I will say, look, I know the landscape has changed. So grad students are not negotiating world that I wasn't negotiating from 03 to 09. Um, where I didn't feel the pressure to have a public platform before I got out of grad school. We created the Crunk Feminist Collective in 2010. So I was a professor, a junior professor, and I didn't have tenure, and so it was risky. But I had a PhD, right? Um, so I would say think about when the moment to go public, because it does live with you forever. Um, but I would also say be tight in your academic work. The only reason that I could have a public career is because I was outperforming on the regular academic standards too. So the thing that I knew about being on the tenure track is that they craft a narrative about you well, you know, is such and such distracted, right? Because they're doing all of these public things. So I was like, cool, when I submit this tenure file, I'm gonna have an edited volume, I'm gonna have this monograph, I'm gonna have you know, all of the, I'm gonna have more articles than necessary. One of those is award winning, lots of refereed book chapters. At Rutgers, you need a book in three or four articles for tenure, maybe. I went up with a book, four articles, two special issues, nine book chapters, 200 public, per okay? I'm also tired of shit, but that's a, 
But that, but literally, but you know, but that's the thing that it required because I didn't want them to have a narrative that I was distracted. So I did more work so that I could create the space. So the thing that you have to know, and, and the other thing is folks are like, oh, but you know, you got paid. I, I got the salon gig three years into writing for Crunk. So at Crunk, I wrote 100 you know, pieces for free over those, the course of those years that were path-breaking pieces that really kind of built the sort of public conversation about black feminism that we wanted to have. And that was free labor that was just about my commitment to people. And we wanted people to be able to access it for free. So, um, so I would say, one, I don't buy into the philosophy of waiting. I do think you have to be strategic about the place where you are. And so I was like figured out, well, here's how the place that I am works. So here are the standards I have to meet. I have to exceed those standards. And then I can do my shit. And don't say shit to me about my shit if I'm doing your shit plus. Right? <laughs> you know? And that's how. But the last thing is like really, really dig in and do the work and be tight. So one of the reasons that people don't mess with me, not, not a lot, they try it. But, and when they do, I can dismiss them. Even like the folks on Twitter yesterday who were sort of stepping to me like I didn't have that body of work, I was like, part of the problem here is like y'all are actually wrong though. And I know that because I've done my work. And so the, the, so the last thing I'll say, the thing I've been telling people is it is as easy as ever to be public, which is the work of like trying to be in community. It is as hard and as slow as it ever was to be a good scholar. So take your time do your shit right, and there's going to be plenty of space for you to do this other thing. Black women have always done this. Black women have never understood scholarship as a private enterprise, not ever. We have always understood the work as something that we were doing for communities, um, and that's part of the reason that it got devalued as not being intellectual enough. Um, and so you're gonna, so I, when I see sisters, I always know that for the most part, they're gonna work in communities in one way or another. The real question is, you know, is, is being strategic and thinking about things as chapters and realizing you don't have to do everything at the same moment. Because even though it may look like I did, y'all just seeing me at the end, but it's been, you know, yeah. it's been nearly 10 years since yeah. I got out of school, yes. you know what I mean? Yo. And that's applicable to everything. Yes. Yes. People ask me all the time, like, so I want to manage a campaign, or I want, I want to do what you're, I want to create my own firm. It's like, okay, well, it's been literally hundreds of miles sleeping in my car, you know, being, it's all the stuff. Right. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So here's what's gonna happen. We have time for one more question, but then we're gonna like mingle and drink and get the book signed and stuff. So we're gonna be around, except for Jessica got to run off to run to shit. Fundraise. Go do a fundraiser yeah. for a campaign. That we're um, gonna come to. Before that question, though, I just want to give a shout out to the Family Centered Social Policy Program here at New America, and my dear friend Rachel Black, who was a white girl who caped hard for black women. <laughs> Um, and she is why we got to be here in this thank space. You. So um, thank, thank you, you. All right, uh, see, so one more question. I'm going to go with you because you're right in my line of sight. But that don't mean that the rest of you can't ask your questions. OK, yes, we can have two. All right, wait, we'll say at the same time. Ask your question, and then you're going to ask your question, okay. and we'll do both. Thank I don't you. Have see, look at that. Democracy. Democracy. Yeah, there we are. Look at that. First, thank you all so much for giving me some life today. Um, you're just so, hey. <laughs> um, but I also, I often struggle with the fact that when we talk about visibility and invisibility, that so, this country, right, this world, right, like, it, it, it survives on the mental, physical, and emotional labor of black women. And it simultaneously disappears us, right? Like I, I often think about the call for Michelle Obama to run for office, and I'm like, you haven't earned that. Mm -hmm. You, you just, you have not earned that. Um, and she, you are not entitled to her labor. So I want to know, or I would like you to share, um, how is it you navigate that space, right? Because I just, I'm at the point now where I'm just like, leave me alone. You, you cannot have from me that which I will no longer give you because I give you everything that I have when I have the capacity to do so. So how do, you, how do you navigate that space of saying, no, you're not entitled to my mental, physical, and emotional labor without feeling compelled to give an explanation because I don't explain anymore. It's just the flat out no and I keep it moving. 
answer your own like, question. Yeah, I, I mean, you yeah, got to figure it out. Yeah. Go ahead and get yeah. this to the question. Um, so my question is more from a policy standpoint in terms of how do we center black women in part of that conversation. Um, I work in a policy space amongst a lot of white faces. Um, and I feel, I'm deeply concerned about 2018. I'm also deeply concerned about 2020 because we have leaders who have convinced themselves that we have to center the policy conversation around working class white men or white mm -hmm. families, um, believing that to center, I believe if you center the conversation around black women, as you said, we're universal and it's inclusive, you'll capture all. Um, and so I'm wondering, especially as we're going forward in these conversations with the current president, et cetera, how do we ensure that this train is not just gonna like veer off and we're never gonna get back on track with this conversation of ensuring that voters of color feel supportive, voters of color feel like the Democratic Party is behind them and that we are not just, well, y'all are always gonna be with us because, I mean, what else are you gonna do? Uh, I'll, I'll speak to that question. Um, I'm actually not, I don't think I'm an expert on saying no, so I'll, I'll, I'll I will learn from you, actually. Um, but I, I think that for me, and I, I can't necessarily speak from a policy, but I do think sort of on this broader political spectrum um, of where um, black women are being seen, being prioritized, being given uh, leadership representation. And I think that um, what, we're, what we have to do is actually um, well, what I'm doing is being very intentional about holding a, a line, not as a purity test, but more a line on the values, what we're fighting for, um, actually need to be as progressive, as radical, as rooted in our needs as possible, um, because they're going to, they're already over here, over here on the right. Right here, clearly. Right. <laughs> All the way over here on the right, right? And not just, not just, um, you know, sort of, the, the 45 or even the Republicans or, or, or the, the um, moderate Democrat. I've heard a lot of left-leaning progressive Democrats sitting with that same sort of, we need to center working right class folks. And it's just, it literally is just, has never, ever, ever, ever worked in this country's history. And I think that we have to be really, uh, this is a time for a lot of that, you know, sort of radical agitation, direct disruption of the political system not actually work doing the work that like what Jessica's doing. We cannot um, w wait for or, or continue to push for them to hear us and to center us. We just gotta do it our damn selves. Yeah. And they're gonna they're they're going to keep going down this road and it's going to explode and, and be a, a, a trash fire. Um, it'll be a shit show, exactly. And that's unfortunate. But we can continue to push for that radical um, vision on the local level especially so that maybe in 2020, maybe in 2022, maybe in 2024, folks start to come around and be like, okay, we'll listen, we'll pay attention. That's mm -hmm. my vision. I mean, I, folks are like, you. Just. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we know each other. So, um, you know, I led a campaign um, over the 2016 election cycle called Democracy in Color. Um, and it essentially was a call to action to the Democratic Party to, to do this very thing, is to speak directly to your base. We actually have the numbers to win at the national level every time if we actually just talked to our own people and didn't give a shit about swing Republican light voters. Um, but we spend hundreds of millions of dollars talking to these folks who hate us um, because they hate the very values that we fight for because we're aspiring to be inclusive. Um, and so our formulas are off. Um, and so for me, it feels a couple things that we get to do. One is they're never gonna win without us. And so I think that this, even though um, this administration is so violent and we're the, first, we're the first harmed, right, and we're in very imminent danger, I will say that what I'm finding in my work is that it's, there's a political renaissance happening. That the innovation around speaking to voters, the innovation around which candidates of color in particular and black women who, who I work with are even addressing campaigns is totally different. We're winning races where we're being outspent literally 10 and 20 to one. I mean, organizations at the national level are completely mystified, but we're winning races with $150,000 to $2 million in, in commercials. That's because like, we're, we're single-handedly in some of those races changing the formulas at which races are won. We have to keep doing that. The only thing I think folks understand, and in particular, people who could center us, is winning. 
And so when we engage in some of these 2017 elections, especially if we engage in 2018, I really believe that we will shift the ways in which people engage us. And I mean, what I'm doing is just building independent black political power. Like, I just don't think we need an institution that we have to beg for shit anymore. Like, that's just not a real thing for me. Yeah. <laughs> I will add that um, I will affirm and validate your feelings of fear. You yeah. should be afraid for 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. Like these are these are real threats. Um, I will further say that how to go about centering Black women's leadership is it is requires restructuring power, yeah. and that is a radical act. Um, and the radical action at the end of the day it comes down to resources and how we resources, resource our movements and how we resource our leadership and how we resource campaigns. So for me, as a technologist, I look at this from a very not emotional data informed place. And so I am afraid because I'm looking at the data and the data says do this and dummies are doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. And those dummies are at the table and that's really scary. What I think is the opportunity is the fact that like, yeah, they are in a dumpster fire, they will drive us off the cliff, while that's happening, we need to be building. Yeah. Because we need, like, they'll burn themselves down, but we need to be building the alternative. Yeah. So that leap comes from Jessica's work, comes from Angela's work, comes from my work, comes from Dr. Cooper's work, comes always from Mia, <laughs> like, keeping us alive as we're doing it. So what are we going to build? What is it gonna look like? I know, I know personally, I'm looking at the like, pro pro so-called progressive resistance nonsense, and I'm seeing these resistance candidates, and they are almost universally hiring the same white led cons political consulting firms that got us in this mess in the first place. And so I'm kind of like, wait a minute, you're hiring the same shops that kind of, no, no, that you are resistance profiteers. You are not here. When your business model, when my freedom is your business model, we are not coming at this problem from the same place. Right. Yep. Right. And so we need to restructure power. And that's what it comes down to. As, to, as for your question, I'm awesome at saying no. I, I love it. Like, I'm kind of like, I dare you to ask me to do something for free. <laughs> so here's the thing. Like, I mean, like, like, you, like you, people have the odd, like, you, I mean, this is the thing. I've been, I, one, I've been informed because, like, I have, my father, like, in, infused in me knowing my worth. And then I got, I'm great at what I do. And so I get recognized for that. And so, like, people I, I respect in my field are like, come on our private jet and tell me what to do. And I'm like, yeah, okay, billionaire, I'll get on your private So like, when, when like that happens, and then some zeros come at me, and they're like, can you come, like, I, I, I will say, I will say exactly the latest no email thread. Um, three weeks, it's like, come to this thing in San Francisco in three weeks, give us two days of free work, help us reimagine the free open web. I want you to guess who Mozilla, like who's, who, who asked me to do it. And I was like, first of all, three weeks, like I'm a busy person, already busy in three weeks. Second of all, I just wrote back, I'm like, what is the compensation for this labor? And they're like, no compensation. And I was like, first of all, and I just like broke it. I was like, one, like one of the values, like all of the sponsoring organizations have like open web, transparency, like our shared values. And I'm like, these are your shared values. Transparently, you should say, this is free work we're asking you to do like on last minute notice, like BT dub, like help us reimagine open web. I'm like, and, and, if, and if you, and these are the constraints, then I'm gonna say the outcomes of that meeting is not gonna lead to a very open web because it's yeah. gonna limit the people who can drop everything, drive, like fly across the country at the last minute yeah. and be in that room. And I'm telling you, I'm not paying that. I'm not paying that cost to my family at the last minute. I'm gonna have to get them to cover me, to pick up this and, like my business that I have to keep going while I'm on this like nonsense two day workshop that benefits you and not me. Um, and so I said, we had this like absurd email chain and where he was, he kept being like, oh, he thought the error was not telling me up front it was, it was like gonna be zero dollars. And I'm no, no, I'm telling you the error was it being zero dollars. <laughs> it's like in another email thread, I'm literally emailing with a billionaire who's like, I'm like, I called him on a Saturday and I was like, I, I, I do a lot of humanitarian tech stuff. And so a lot of services are gonna go off, uh, get disappeared um, because of 45. So we're trying to get line up private donors to fill the gap. And so I called him on a Saturday and I was like, I need 50 million for this specific refugee project, da 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 No, no, Friday, I need this. And then Saturday I saw he tweeted something dumb and I called him, I was like, that was dumb. And I like, left a voicemail. And then on Sunday I get an email, I was like, only you would, um, 
ask me for 50 million on a Friday and like 40, 24 hours later, call me a dummy. And he's like, by the way, I, that was absurd. Why did I, I'm, I shouldn't have said that. I was like, yeah, because I'm ready. Hey, here's your check. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so not everybody has infused in them Sabrina's ability to say no. Come and, correct or don't and come. To, and to know our worth, right? Black yeah. women are told every day that we're shit. Um, I have this theory, which Brittany has heard a little bit of, I think. <laughs> I've refined it some. So uh, white entitlement, white fragility, white women's tears in particular. So there's this parasite that infects rat brains. And I know, it's an analogy, it'll work. Um, and it, it makes them sexually aroused by cats. And they throw the, I know y'all looking at me like I'm crazy, but it's going somewhere. So they, they basically, they throw themselves at cats and they, they meet their demise. And I believe that what, when we are faced with white fragility, white entitlement, white women's tears, we often feel compelled to explain, to apologize, to not value ourselves. I know that's a weird analogy, y'all, but I feel like right, white, white fragility and entitlement is kind of like the rat brain parasite. And we need to learn to inoculate ourselves against that thing because we, I mean, I've, I feel I, I have faced white women's tears and I have to sit there and go, don't say, don't apologize, don't mm -hmm. apologize, don't make her feel better, don't comfort her, just let her cry. <laughs> and, and you, and like, <laughs> so, and we just have to do that work. There's no, like, not all of us get to be, like, well, you are no exceptional in that time. way. <laughs> yes, but it, but it yeah. is the, it's the, but yeah. there's a physical discomfort that we sometimes yeah. feel to not try to comfort the other person, to not prioritize white people's emotions and feelings feel in front of our own. Seeing white people in the I know, right? Like, wait, let, we should explain. We should just no, explain. No. I mean, it's See, real. I actually feel like that's not, my struggle actually was, is with black folks. Like, mm -hmm. I really, I get asked to do a lot of work for free. Mm -hmm. I get asked yes. to do a lot of talks, a lot of coaching for free. Mm -hmm. And a part of it is so, because we have right. so much need. Yes. We have so much need. Yes. And yeah. it's so under-resourced. Like, again, all the, our political climate and black political representation is not an accident. We, mm -hmm. Our yep. path is blocked in a lot of ways. But I really struggle to say, like, I'm one human. I'm not magic. I know it seems like I'm doing a lot. I am doing Large a lot. It is, four, it is 14 hour days. If you want me to spend a half hour with you, if you want me to travel to your coffee, you're asking me to take away from getting a mayor elected. You're asking me to take away from writing a proposal. You're asking me to, right? And it's, it's not that I don't love you. And I think that's what I struggle with the no is, mm -hmm. is like, I really love black women so deeply. I wish I could spend all day giving free advice and I just, can't. It like actually is like physically and literally in my life I can't and so I struggle. I really struggle and then I'll find myself on the phone and I'm trying to multitask and I'm melting yep. and I get off the phone and I'm like you did that thing again mm -hmm. because yep. you wanted it yep. and now you're exhausted and you're crying because you like got a paper cut and it really it's not about the paper cut it's because you're just <laughs> Cause fucking exhausted because <laughs> I'm empty. Because you're empty and yeah. I kind of I've hit I think I've been emptied, and I've just been like, I'm never going back to yep. that again. Yeah. And holding that line and getting my needs met and prioritizing what I need for the yes has meant that I like I don't want to feel like I've had cried over paper cuts before, and I'm like, it's a paper cut. Yeah. <laughs> I know, yeah. like everything is hard. <laughs> let me, let me. So I just want to affirm that, like, that you have the right to, and the thing is. But it's just like when black women have to do the work around knowing that we're pretty and knowing that we're worthy. Sometimes you just have to stand in the mirror every morning and say it. Mm, like, you know, yeah. that I have the right to my no, right? That my mm. no's are yes to myself, yes. right? Um, and, and saying that until that becomes truth for you. Um, the thing I want to say about um, white people and centering white working class folks is, um, so I don't know a lot about how to do it in policy, but I think that sometimes it's really useful to understand, I mean, I think black people understand white people far more than they would ever know that we know. Um, I mean, we have to, it's a matter of survival. But I also, but there's a psychology with white people where, so, so the person that helped me with this is Anna Julia Cooper, I write about in my book, and in her book in 1892, she has this whole allegory where she talks about how if we, reconstruction for black folks was really a situation in which, the, she says, look, the Civil War was basically that, that white people in the North, you know, she called them the big brother and the white people in the South were the little sister. That basically little sister had got out of control and was just acting up and wouldn't do right and was ruining everything the family had built. And so basically they had to discipline little sister. 
And then that reconstruction was, well, we're tired of fighting now. Yeah. And so we're ready to get back together again. And so now, you know, we're, we're you know, let's, let's stop fighting. Like, everything will be well. So what do you need us to do so we can stop fighting? Um, and so I'd like to think about that family analogy sometimes. Because when I watch white people just pivoting, liberal white folks, right, just pivoting back and, you know, Bernie Sanders being like, oh, because, you know, white working class voters aren't racist or sexist. And it's like, do you know the definition of racism and sexism? <laughs> Because if you did, like, I mean, I don't understand. You know what I mean? What are you talking about? And so, but it's because there's a psychology that what white people fought the Civil War for is they wanted the union, not because they had a solidarity with black people, right? This is the thing we know. And so white people have a psychology around, they really do see these white workers, they empathize with them. They know them. They're in families with them. And they want to be connected to them. They can't throw... So it's interesting, right? Because they are struggling to throw their people away. It's the one place where, even though white people love to think of themselves as individuals, even white liberal people are doing white identity politics in that moment, right? Yeah. It's not just the right that's doing it. Yeah. It's liberal folks, too, because they really identify with these yeah. people. Um, and so, I, so what I would say to white people that's very provocative, it's going to make you uncomfortable, I'm going to say it. One of the things white people really need to think about in this moment is that the only thing that has ever caused your people to change around race and class is the Civil War. And what was the Civil War? The Civil War was a war in which white people had to kill other white people to get them to treat black people well. With that. <laughs> wow. Don't do me that way. Yes, I am. That's exactly where we need to we end. We all went to school. Food and some drinks. <laughs> Can you say thank you? Can you?